my eyes to your wonders anew. You've captured my heart with this love. Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. You've opened my eyes to your wonders anew. You've captured my heart with this love. Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. Beautiful one I love. Beautiful one I adore. Beautiful one my soul must sing. Beautiful one I love. Beautiful one I adore. Beautiful one, my soul must sing. God, thank you for being a wonderful, beautiful God that we can worship, not only this morning, but every day. Thank you for being here this morning with us. Thank you for the gift of your son that we are celebrating this season. Lord, I pray that... Your spirit would be working powerfully this morning through the preaching of your word, through singing praises to you, through the fellowship of believers. Lord, we pray this all in your precious son's name. Amen. You may be seated. So, you know, as we continue to celebrate Advent, we find ourselves with today's theme, which rejoice. And we certainly have a lot to rejoice about, don't we? We sure do. You know, but the truth is, there are some folks that this time of year is not a time for joy, and they have a hard time finding reasons to rejoice. Making travel arrangements, <clears throat> cleaning and decorating the house, cleaning and putting up the decorations on the Christmas tree, fighting the crowds at the stores while shopping, mailing Christmas cards, trying to meet the expectations that are created by social media and commercials of what Christmas is supposed to look like, <clears throat> grieving the losses of family members who are no longer with us, and thinking about the friends and relatives that may be coming over that maybe we don't get along with very well. They all can create a lot of stress this time of year, don't they? And for those folks, joy is the last thing that they feel, and rejoicing seems so far from them. And this begs the question, how can we have, or how can we enhance our experience of joy and truly rejoice this Christmas season. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. I appreciate that. <laughs> so the place to start is to recognize that the kind of joy that God wants us to experience, not just joy, because there's different kinds of joy, but the joy that God wants us to experience comes as a fruit of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, we read, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So understanding the importance of accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior and our receiving of the Holy Spirit are prerequisites to having the kind of joy that God wants us to experience, that God intended for us to experience. And yet there are times when even those of us who have the Holy Spirit struggle with expressing joy and with rejoicing. Well, did you know that there are, there are activities that we can participate in that can increase our joy? Now, please understand, I am not presenting a seven-step program on how to have joy but rather um, looking at ways that we can cooperate with the Holy Spirit in having more joy, experiencing more joy, and rejoicing and going into that experience. So then what are, what are some of the activities that can fan the flame of godly joy and place ourselves in that rejoicing experience? Well, let's look at the letter of, uh, that Paul had written to the Philippians for some ideas on that. <clears throat> Now, the letter of joy in its various forms is found 16 times in this short letter. And the word rejoice is used 50% of the time. So it clearly, at least one of the themes of this letter is about joy 
and rejoicing. It's also important to remember that uh, the church at Philippi was being threatened by society around them. Remember, Christianity was illegal. And Paul was in, on their house arrest in Rome for promoting a gospel, promoting the gospel, when he wrote this letter. Also, Philippi was a Roman city with a significant amount of, po of the population being retired Roman legion soldiers. The kind of folks that crucified Jesus so again, this was a hostile environment that the Philippians were living in. <clears throat> in addition, there was apparently some struggle happening within the church as well, because in his letter, Paul spends time exhorting them toward humility and unity. And why would he do that unless there were things that needed to be addressed, like humility and unity? <clears throat> and yet joy and rejoicing are woven throughout this letter, mainly because, as we shall see, Joy and rejoicing are part of the antidotes to the problems that they were facing. Now, you and I face similar issues today. And while our struggle living in our society does not rise to the level that the Philippians were experiencing, they're still substantial. And the church of the living God does have struggles from within. It always has. Just about every letter written in the New Testament addresses a struggle of some kind in the body of Christ. And we're no different. And so it appears that this letter has something to say for us today. So let's start by reading Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. At this point in the letter, Paul is beginning to address some of the internal struggling, uh, struggles in the Philippian house churches. So let's start by reading that text. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. And in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So I want to frame this as we begin, and you can see I have bolded there, make my joy complete. Now Paul is saying that what precedes that particular statement brings him joy, and what follows increases his joy. In essence, what he is saying is, if you've experienced these things, then rejoice. Because in your rejoicing, I rejoice. But let's not stop there. Let's rejoice even more. So then the question is, what is it that brings Paul joy? Well, let's look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, if you have any encouragement by being united with Christ. Now, we're united with Christ when we recognize our sinfulness and our need for him in every area of our lives. Being united with Christ is knowing that Jesus Christ put aside his glory was born a human child, lived a human life, died an agonizing death by crucifixion to pay for our sins, rose from the dead, and is right now sitting as our advocate at the right hand of God the Father, who happens to sit on the throne of the universe. We are united with Christ when we allow him to change us into his image by the Holy Spirit. Being united with Christ is an awareness of our salvation and our sanctification, and that God will finish the work that he started within us. It is an encouragement that issues from, is rooted in, and is sustained by a living fellowship with Jesus. Have you ever experienced this kind of encouragement? Then rejoice. Rejoice. Next, if you have any comfort from his love. Have you ever experienced the comfort that comes from God's agape love? Have we come to recognize that our value comes from God's love for us and not from our performance or our position or even our progress in spiritual maturity? And that this love will not change because it's not based on who we are and what we do. It's based on who God is. 
and that he will never leave us and forsake us, ever. Have you experienced the comfort that comes from God's agape love? Then rejoice. Rejoice. If any common sharing in the Spirit. Now, common sharing in the Spirit is translated here from the Greek word koinonia, and is, closely, is worded closely associated with the concepts of a holy covenantal relationship, fellowship. Koinia is more than friendship. It is a divinely intimate, holy, and loving unity among believers and between believers and the Lord. And it involves everything from spiritual oneness to community life and to the sharing of money and food. And it is expressed and experienced in the communion with the sharing in the body and blood of Jesus Christ, which we will be partaking in next Sunday. You know, Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 23, uh, 22, rather, verses 37 to 39, to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. <clears throat> when we love others as ourselves, there's a joining, there's a uniting, there's a partnership. It says, in effect, that we're all in this together. Or, as the Apostle Paul used as an analogy, we are all part of one body. We are all connected, and we are all interrelated. Koinonia, or koinonia, rather, is also an alternate society. It exists within and interacts with our culture, but it is an alternate to our culture. It is something that is to be so desirable that when people experience it, they choose to leave the kingdom of this world and enter into the kingdom of God. It is also what is meant by one of our core values when we say building and maintaining relationships. We're talking about koinonia. Have you ever experienced koinonia? Then rejoice. Rejoice. If any tenderness, to experience God's tenderness is to experience God's caring that arises from deep within his heart. It's like sitting on our father's lap when we skinned our knees and we need a hug. It's the care of the great shepherd over his flock. It's the heavenly father saying, I'll be a father to you to you. It's the loving mother who comforts her children. It's the apple of God's eye that is guarded and protected. It's the redeemer that tenderly deals with us sinners. It's the savior who gently restores Peter by saying, do you love me? When he stumbles. It's the pruning knife not used unnecessarily and never cutting too deeply. It is the recognition of the weaknesses of our faith and God's declaration, again, I will not leave you and I will not forsake you. It's the caring of us during the trials of this life when we are simply too tired to put one foot in front of another. Have you ever experienced God's tenderness? Rejoice. Rejoice. And compassion. To experience God's compassion is to experience his mercy. It's the loving embrace that restores us when we sin and that says to us, don't let shame or guilt stop you from coming to me. Have you ever experienced God's compassion? Rejoice. Rejoice. So being united with Christ, finding comfort in his love, experiencing koinonia, receiving both tenderness and compassion, all should bring us to a measurable joy and lead us into an experience of rejoicing. But as good as that gets, it gets better. It gets better. Again, Paul says that it is possible to increase our joy beyond these five reasons to rejoice and to increase his joy as well, even to the point where that joy can be filled to the brim. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, then make my joy complete. Now, this, of course, is talking about Paul's joy, but I want to look at it a different way as well. As a parent, as a parent or an aunt or an uncle or a brother or sister, how much joy do you receive when you give a gift to your child or a child and they get so excited they can hardly contain themselves? You ever see a child do a happy dance? 
You ever see they're so excited? They just, they can't believe they got this gift that they, they have, you know? <clears throat> so when the child expressed, or rejoiced rather, in the gift that they received, didn't that bring joy to your heart? Didn't that feel good? Now here's a neat thought. Do you think that maybe, just maybe, that when we truly rejoice before our Heavenly Father at the many gifts that He has given to us, that we might bring joy to His heart? Again, that's kind of a neat thought, isn't it? As we rejoice, we bring joy to our Heavenly Father. Well, Paul gives us some more insights on how that can happen. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, once again, it says, being like-minded. Well, what does it mean to be like-minded? Well, it means, it really involves two areas, right? The first is believing and thinking the right things. In other words, to having a shared statement of faith or shared doctrines. And by the way, you can find that presented our, in our core value entitled, Understanding and Living the Word of God. You'll find that in there. And the second, having the same thoughts, the same opinions, and plans with other believers as we engage in the same great work, which is the salvation of souls, or as we say here at North Street, ministering Jesus to our congregation and to our community. What Paul is calling for here is unity, not uniformity of thought. He desires the saints to have a common disposition to work together and to serve one another. It is to listen to each other and to recognize that God speaks to each of us and that as we move forward, we do the best we can to move forward together. And folks, sometimes to get to the place of like-mindedness, sometimes it takes some time. Sometimes it involves reminding ourselves that we have the same overall goals but we might differ in how we ought to reach those goals. So you see, being like-minded is moving forward together in koinonia. Having the same love. This love being the agape love that is God. A love that he has bestowed upon us and that we are to bestow upon each other. It's the same kind of sacrificial love shown to us by Jesus. And remember, Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's the sign, folks. That's the sign of the church. Love for God, love for each other, love for the world around us. That's the sign. It's okay, it's wonderful to be involved in, in wonderful events like concerts and movies and and wonderful times of fellowship, like bike rides or motorcycle rides, those are all wonderful things to be involved in. But those are not the sign. <laughs> the sign is the love of God should have brought in our hearts toward him, toward each other, and toward the world around us. Now this love is not sentimental or emotional, but it is instead obedient. It is a, manif it is a manifestation of the act of one's will that desires another's highest good. And again, not only for those in the church, but for those outside the church as well. And it is unconditional. It is unconditional. Philippians 2.2, 2, again, being one in, mind, in spirit and of one mind. To be one in spirit means to be joined together in soul. The sentiment is that of being in an orchestra with all the different instruments working harmoniously as if they were one soul and like each of us being soulmates to each other in the highest spiritual sense. To be of one mind means to set one's mind and heart on the same thing and to have the same purpose. So to be of one, sp in, to one in spirit and of one mind is when the hearts of believers are knit together and mutually constrained by the same urges and the same desires. <clears throat> Again, it's not reasonable to expect that Christians are going to see eye to eye on every detail. Our thoughts and actions are largely influenced by our heredity, by our environment, by our education, by our experiences, and so on. But it does mean that we work together toward the same end with the same love and the same respect.
Now, at this point, Paul recognizes that differences of opinion do happen, right? And he begins to explain how to resolve some of those things when they do come up. So before we go on, though, I, I want to remind ourselves the context of all this. The context of all this is joy, right? It's, it's expressing joy. It's receiving more joy. It's giving joy to our Father in heaven. That's the context of all this, that as we engage in these activities, we're bringing more joy to us, ourselves, and to the world around us. <clears throat> so step number one, when we find ourselves in that place where we have some uh, differences of opinion, is to check out our own motives. Are we doing what we're doing out of selfish ambition or conceit? Are we demonstrating selfishness? Do we have a self-love that prompts us to disregard the rights or the feelings of other people? Now, don't be too dismissive of this question. If we, have, if we deny that we have selfishness in us, then we're not being truthful with ourselves. Our human nature is inherently selfish. It is. But the question here is, is our selfishness motivating us to behave in the way that we're behaving? And nobody can make that decision for you. Only you can bring that to Jesus to determine whether that's true or not. The same is true of vain conceit. The Greek word here describes the glory that this world affords us, which appears very desirable to our human nature, but which is devoid of any good or eternal value. It describes the person who is ambitious for their own reputation, is jealous and willing to fight to prove that he or she is right. It is an attitude of personal vanity and of self-promotion. And sometimes we see this in someone who's trying to build a personal following and in doing so does not manifest love of the brethren or love for Jesus, but rather to promote the self. And honestly, folks, sometimes don't even realize they're doing it or maybe we're doing it. But again, nobody can make that decision for you. You have to analyze that yourself and look at it yourself. And what's interesting about these two steps, it doesn't say try to figure out the other person's motivation try to figure out whether the other person has a good attitude. It's talking about we looking at ourselves. Is our motivation right? Are our attitudes aligned with Jesus? Now the second step is also to check our attitudes. Are we being humble? In the Greco-Roman world, and frankly in the world we live in, considers humility to be held in contempt. You don't have to look far to notice this in our day and age, right? Just look at our politics. And those considered to be leaders in business and the way that they treat other people, the way they put down other people. Now, Peter, Paul here, rather, is going counter to a culture. A, cal a culture which says that to be low on the social scale, to know poverty, or to be socially powerless is shameful. And it's also important to remember that Jesus himself went counterculture when he elevated humility to be a supreme virtue, a virtue which pro pro provides an antidote for the self-love that poisons relationships and creates disunity. Are we humble? Do we, and do we value others more than ourselves? Do we give careful thought as to how we care for other people? Jesus did. You see, Jesus valued us and the world around us over himself so much that he chose to die for us in payment for all of our sins. Philippians 2.4, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Now to look here, the skopio, which is the Greek word, it, it really, literally means to really take an interest in them, not just a casual glance but to really be concerned about and take an interest in them. It means that we do not make a habit of looking only to our own affairs, but to the exclusion of everybody else's. And Paul's point is that if we are truly looking out for the interests of others, that we will be raising them and lowering ourselves in order to facilitate unity in the body. And finally, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. So, if we are, if we, so we are to look at our own motives, 
to check our own attitudes, and finally, we are to focus on our spiritual formation. We are to have the same mindset as Christ. To have the same mindset means to set one's mind or heart upon and to seek or strive for, and refers to our basic orientation or our bent, okay, in our thought patterns and our minds. In this case, we set our mind and heart on becoming like Jesus. And the tense here from Paul, the tense in these statements, he is not making a suggestion. He's commanding that the saints at Philippi be, be transformed by the renewing of their mind. Because he knows that only in this way can they and we carry out the command for Christ-like behavior, such as trying to be selfless and trying to be humble. Once again, you can see our third core value represented here, empowering people toward growth. Anyway, our flesh gravitates toward selfishness and pride. And once again, it's, it's vital to remember that Christ has not left us alone to try to carry this out by ourselves, this transformation. He has given each and every believer a wonderful helper, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ that helps move us into Christ-likeness. Therefore, it's important for us to remember that the Spirit of Christ, Jesus Christ, is in us. He's in us, continually working and continually giving us the desire and the power to carry out God's commands. Now, addressing what the mindset of Christ looks like is a sermon for another day. Okay? But as we look at the life example of Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to transform us into His image, and likeness, we begin to resolve problems God's way, and in doing so, bring greater unity to the body of Christ. Will the worship team kind of come on up and kind of wrap this up here? <clears throat> you know, as we experience the various events of this season, it can feel overwhelming. This third Sunday of Advent reminds us of the rejoicing that we are to embrace this time of year being united with Christ, finding comfort from his love, experiencing koinonia, receiving both tenderness and compassion, all bring us to experience immeasurable joy and lead us to rejoice in our Lord and Savior. And in that rejoicing, we bring joy to our Heavenly Father. But it doesn't have to stop there. We can bring even greater joy and rejoicing to our great God and within our own experiences. By being like-minded, having the same agape love for each other, and when differences of opinions happen, checking, checking our own motives and attitudes and pursuing spiritual formation in order to express the same mindset as Christ Jesus, not only brings us and others within the body of Christ greater joy, it so blesses God's heart. So what do you say that we not only rejoice ourselves this Christmas season as we recognize all that God has done for us, but let's see if we can bring God some rejoicing as well. Strong and mighty tower, your name 
encounter like no other your name let the nations sing it louder but nothing has the power to save but your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nations sing it louder but nothing has the power to save but your Would you enhance our experience of joy this day as we draw, and as we draw closer to Christmas Day and all that this day represents? And as we meditate on your ways in which you love us, would you ignite in us a contagious sense of joy that overflows out of our hearts and, and that spills over into the lives of those around us and that blesses your heart? So, Father, we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen.